everyone. Welcome to a new podcast. Uh, this is one that my wife, Lalandra, has been working on. And today we're going to be talking with Olive Heffernan. She's a uh, science journalist who's been working for, or she's written for uh, Wired, Nature, the, the peer-reviewed journal, National Geographic, New Scientist, Salon, Scientific American, The Guardian, BBC Magazines, and a number of others. And we're going to be talking today about climate change. You know that hoax that, that we hear all about. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, so from so many, so many of the uh, uh, the political right over here that that are seemingly also always beholden to the fossil fuel industries. Why is it that everybody who denies climate change also has a vested interest in fossil fuels somehow? Anyway, how do you do? And I'm going to let my wife uh, introduce herself, and you guys take over. Okay, uh, the first thing in order to uh, start communicating about climate change. Uh, I was reading is that we should we should know well uh, what we know about climate change and what we're trying to communicate about climate change. So it it might the first question is it might help to get a realistic idea of what the evidence points to for climate change. We have heard a lot of arguments that are sound alarmist or maybe just hyperbole. Like there was the one called the uninhabitable inhabitable earth and perhaps uh he was uh, his tone was on purpose uh talking about what the crisis it is i mean there were a few parts of it that people a lot of scientists disagreed with but let's let's have since you have worked uh in with marine fisheries and what are some consequences if we don't meet that two degrees uh, Celsius warming deadline that are realistic? What are we yeah. talking about here? I mean, that's a good question. Um, so the IPCC has recently documented some pretty, um, that's the UN climate body, they've recently documented some pretty concrete outcomes for the ocean if we fail to, um, or even if we reach two degrees Celsius of warming, or compared to say 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. And, um, you know, just to name a few of those, uh, in a general sense, obviously we'll see more warming, more acidification, more um, expansion of the ocean's oxygen depleted or dead zones. Um, but specifically, we'll also see things like more sea level rise. So even at two degrees, we will see an extra 10 centimeters um, of likely sea level rise by the end of this century. And, you know, for some of the indicators, it's even more alarming. Like if you look at Arctic sea ice loss, for example, the chances of an ice free summer increase from 3% at 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming to 63% if we reach three degrees Celsius. Um, and also with marine heat waves, I think by the end of this century, if we hit two degrees Celsius of warming, we'll be looking at a 23 fold increase in the likelihood of um, days within a given year with marine heat waves versus only a 16 fold increase if we limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So, you know, beyond two degrees, we're going to get more of the same. Um, for a lot of those indicators, the uncertainty becomes greater beyond two degrees Celsius. But um, the overall picture is that, you know, it's, it's obviously much worse for the ocean. I'd like to paint a picture for, you know, for paleoclimatology uh, for a moment. I mean, a lot of people are going to yeah. say that, you know, that so what the planet gets warm, it's been warm, warmer than this before, you know, and OK, yeah, it has. But when it was, uh, the, United, the North American continent was divided in half by the Western Interior Seaway, and, and, and Florida didn't exist, and coincidentally, neither did California. So I mean, th those are important points to make. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, also important to, you know, just consider the context of the fact that we now have so many more, you know, people um, on Earth who are dependent on the ocean. You know, if you take somewhere like the Bay of Bengal, for example, there's tens of millions of people who are living there who are dependent on um, fisheries, both for their livelihoods and for protein. And um, that is set to become the world's largest um, dead zone, you know, oxygen depleted area. So that's going to have major ramifications for the people that are living there. Um, you know, and overall, you know, when we look at the ocean, look, it has 
you know, absorbed 90% of the excess heat that has been um, generated as a result of climate change. And the reality is it just can't continue to provide this service for us indefinitely. Like at some point, that heat is going to come back out to the other, you know, earth systems, whether it's through sort of melting of ice or just, you know, re-entering the atmosphere. Um, so it's really important that we protect the health of the ocean. I think it's one of those, um, you know, issues in climate change that really needs more attention. I think you're muted, sweetheart. Thank you, sweetie. Um, there, there, there are several issues uh, with the ocean that are have disastrous consequences for the rest of the Earth. Uh, as we we burn more carbon when we release it from from trees or emissions burning fossil fuels, uh, the ocean absorbs. Uh, uh, the carbon and there's acidification and you're talking about dead zones and also changing the it's like an aquarium if uh, aquariums have uh, very strict tolerances for temperature acid acidity um, and if you change the uh, temperature of the ocean um, th there's big consequences for economies that depend on fishing and uh, you're talking about um, the Bay of Bengal. Uh, if England, uh, I believe where you're from and you're right now, or, or sorry, UK, <laughs> you're 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 um, Irish, right? Yeah, I live in Ireland. I did live in the UK for 12 years, but I'm back in Ireland no, it's now. Really different <laughs> accent as well. Um, <laughs> um, the 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 temperature on land is affected by the ocean. There's a there's a warm current coming up from the equator that is uh, is keeps the UK warmer than it would be. Sure. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Like, so yeah, that's right. The Gulf Stream. That's actually part you know partly driven by something called AMOC, which is the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, and then. Um, you know, that's, again, one of those um, aspects of the ocean that is due to suffer under climate change. So I think, you know, if we hit two degrees Celsius of warming or beyond, scientists think that, that the actual sort of strength in the overturning circulation could decrease by as much as 34 percent. Um, and I think it's only 11 percent if we keep it you know, within 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. So, you know, obviously those sorts of changes are huge and it would have a big impact on, on climate here. So the Gulf Stream runs along the west coast of Ireland and that sort of gives us our sort of mild temperate climate. I mean, it's interesting because here, you know, when, when you talk about climate change here, people are, you know, I think they're worried about sea level rise. They're worried about things like flood, flooding and maybe storm risk, but really not about temperature rise because it's so mild here. But, you know, I don't know how much that could possibly change. Can you give us a sense? Also, also changing, changing the flow of the current, if uh, there needs to be an exchange in temperatures to keep these currents circulating and it's important to sea life also like uh, everybody knows uh cold water sinks hot hot water rises the same as air and this this uh this takes um oxygen down to the bottom to feed uh uh life at the bottom to help them breathe and then I'm probably sounding really simplistic here, but um, but also the the upswell from uh, the current takes nutrients from the bottom and for yeah. the fish to feed on. And we talk about El Nino, like so in a in a bad year for El Nino, uh, that current uh, it, it it makes a bad year for fishing. So it, it's well connected. Those dynamics are really important. Those sort of, you know, as you say, sort of sinking and upwelling dynamics. 
Um, without those, we wouldn't have deep water formation in places like the Southern Ocean. And you know, think about so many of the life forms that you know probably um, require those nutrients. You know, at a very basic level, it's interesting to think that the plankton in the ocean actually produces at least half of the oxygen that's in the Earth's atmosphere. I think that's one of the most powerful messages that's come out on climate change in recent years. You know, that just simple message that actually every second breath of oxygen that we take is generated by plankton in the ocean. So we really can't afford to mess with these systems. You know, and at a very basic level, it is those, you know, we are, you know, altering the climate in a way that we are changing, you know, fundamental planetary um, systems, such as, as you mentioned, the overturning circulation, but also when you think about the North Atlantic jet stream, you know, these are big atmospheric circulation patterns and big oceanic circulation patterns that we are now altering with, you know, with human generated pollution, essentially. And I think that that's, you know, incredibly worrying. One of the issues that we have is, is a lot of people that, that want to reject this do so, I think, because uh, because they don't they don't want to have responsibility. They don't want to change anything about what they do. And they don't understand that it's not necessarily what people do, individuals, but it's what corporations do. That's where all of the damage is being done. And that's where all of the all of the the uh, the correction, if I understand this correctly, is going to be coming from. It's going to have to it's top down legislation. And I'd, li I'd like you to comment on that, if you would, please. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, yeah, there's so many sort of ways to respond to that. You know, you're absolutely right that there are people um, who want to reject this. And I think that, you know, that is often tied to vested interests around not wanting to change economic activity, you know, maybe on a larger scale. And then on an individual scale, it's people don't want to be dictated to. They don't want to feel that there's going to be regulations put in place that will dictate their lives to them, you know, going forward. And, you know, that's understandable. I suppose, you know, what that tells us is that it's important how we communicate the message of climate change. And in some ways, it's important to communicate to people that they have choices, but that we will all need to make changes. I mean, you're absolutely right that I think look, as individuals, we can't tackle climate change alone. We need governmental oversight, whether that's in the form of putting a price on carbon or, you know, changing where our energy sources come from. We need governmental oversight. But, um, you know, I guess what would really happen or help is if, you know, the electric electorate bought into that and if people were willing to actually make changes in their own lives. So just coming back to the point of giving people choices, I think that recently um, the IPCC did a really good job of this. They actually um, issued a report in August, which was about climate change and land use. And they basically recommended eight diets that you could um, have or adhere to and that they were all sort of UN approved diets that were climate friendly diets. And the message was, look, you don't have to become a vegan. You don't have to be a vegetarian to do this. You know, you could eat a Mediterranean diet. You could have a flexitarian diet. But, you know, you just need to consider what you're consuming. I thought that was a really good way of, you know, getting that message across. It was very inclusive, while at the same time telling people, look, we all need to think about what we're doing and we need to do something to change. Um, I saw that you wrote a an article about plant-based proteins. Sure, yeah. Yes. And for me, I, I think in America and in uh, countries with access to grocery stores and different types of restaurants, perhaps we can uh, change our eating habits, even if it's just a meatless day of the week, like a flexitarian. We, Arne and I do that whenever possible, but um, but developing countries, sometimes those proteins are cheaper. I think, isn't don't you think science has the future here? Creating uh, plant-based proteins that we can eventually sell uh, at, for lower cost than meat and that take up less land and have less of a carbon footprint? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the plant-based 
diets, yeah, I think that we do need more plant-based proteins. And, you know, it would be amazing if we got to the point of being able to develop something like, I think it was the Impossible Burger that I that I wrote about. And I subsequently went and ate one <laughs> in New York, which was extremely tasty. And I'd highly recommend it. It was wonderful. Um, but at the moment, it's really expensive, you know, to... I mean, they just aren't in a position to basically roll those out, you know, in supermarkets, at least that particular brand. And I think the sort of idea of, you know, growing meat in the lab is also um, something that people are investigating. But right now, that's really expensive. Of course, over time with technology, the costs of that will come down. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting because if you look at diets, it's, you know, it's complicated. Like, for example, um, recently I've been eating a lot of tofu, but then I also read that, you know, a lot of that is sourced from Argentina. So, you know, that's not really a, a great option either. I think, you know, you really need to do your research to kind of find out where your, your food is being sourced from as well. It um, requires a bit of research. You're correct about... Uh lab created meats that's still really expensive the last i checked two hundred thousand a what a pound or something and but a uh, plant plant-based protein is really starting to get affordable like the worst in in the united states we're starting to have beyond meat in our supermarkets oh yeah okay and and impossible foods is is trying to move to supermarkets too but the demand is so high that they have to raise more capital capital to produce more. So, like, there's this argument that perhaps consumers are selfish and they want to do things the same way they've always done them. But it, in this particular experiment, uh, when when these alternatives are available, people are buying them. And they're going back to fast food restaurants where they were bored of them before that are offering them. So. Yeah, yeah. I think we're probably seeing a shift towards more public acceptance as well, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, not, I think so. Not just for, for uh, I, I, they could make them healthier in, in our fast food restaurants right now. They still have, they don't have cholesterol, but they have too much salt as a preservative, but uh, in our fast food. But this to me, I see the future and I see that there there is more acceptance for it. And maybe not even just from a global warming perspective, but also from an animal, animal cruelty perspective. And uh, and it can it can be we could tailor it to which, where it's much more healthier than meat. But we so far they're they wanting they're still wanting it to taste just like a Whopper, like the Whopper you had in New York. Oh, yeah. They want it to taste like the meat Whopper. So. It, it, I'm, it's very promising to me and I'm for mixed interventions like like uh, business, entrepreneurial, things like that. And Absolutely. also, I, I still think that there needs to be policy worldwide global policy Absolutely. yeah I mean I think that's we're absolutely not, true we're I think not that, uh, without that we're just not gonna crack this nut but I think that I suppose I feel like you know if there's a groundswell of support like you know what we're seeing now I think is quite promising like all of the energy in terms of the you know the school strikes and you know extinct extinction rebellion all of those movements i think are saying that people have had enough you know people are angry and they're angry at their leaders for you know not acting and to me that it's great to see that because you know 10 years ago we had the un cop in copenhagen and everyone thought that that was going to be a resounding success and we'd really get a you know a very very strong global deal on climate change and then it all just fell apart at the last minute i think a lot of people walked away from that feeling very disillusioned and very disheartened and so you know i, I think we sort of then entered this stage of real apathy you know there was just people were deflated and they were burnt out of hearing about it and in some ways, you know, we've talked a lot about denial, but I think one of the things that's almost as bad, you know, as denial is just apathy. People who are fully informed, but they just can't muster the energy to actually do anything, like we're stagnating somehow. Um, and I feel like we've sort of moved past that. Like maybe we have moved past peak indifference on climate change. And what we're now seeing is demands for action. I mean, it's kind of unbelievable that today they called off the next cop because of climate protests in the streets in chile so that's kind of 
unbelievable to think that that's happened. This is a good segue to what we what we were talking about with communicating to people about climate change and we kind of have yeah. to differentiate the government policy debate where you're talking about what we should do or if we should do anything which we're not getting very far in the u.s at least right now yeah. and um, they and talking to people that you know where y you might have you might have a, a greater chance of persuading someone that something needs to be done and um, your your experience, you you at Nature, you had a climate feedback blog. That's where, right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, mm, where you yeah. were putting out research and papers on climate because you're wanting to put more knowledge out there, right? About climate change. Yeah, and that's right. That's another level. the The scientific discourse that, and we need to have that discussion because we need to decide what exactly we're going to do right now. Uh, what's going to give us the most payout? But um, well, let's talk about it on a personal level. Do you have experience uh, can uh, persuading someone to accept climate change that did that didn't? Um, yeah, well, I did have actually a, a good friend about 10 years ago who um, is a scientist who at the time wasn't at all convinced that it was human caused. Um, uh, they were more convinced that climate variability was behind climate change. And so we had many discussions about it. And, and that person is now doing quite a lot of climate change related research. So, I, I mean, I don't know if um, they are absolutely convinced. I know that, but I don't know whether I'm the sole instigator of that. But we did have many conversations. And so, you know, I'd like to think that I had some input into that. Um, and then I've had other more difficult cases, like someone I know who likes to challenge the science on an ongoing basis and sort of, you know, will dig out a paper from 30 years ago that says something about solar flares and bring it to the dinner <laughs> table. Um, I just keep the conversation going, you know, and I sort of sometimes bring it back to the whole sort of consensus. And, you know, do you actually think that like the entire scientific community is part of a conspiracy or you know how do, you know so i sort of try to talk about the bigger picture as well as individual pieces of research that might persuade them on whatever you know their sort of um, myth they're you know clinging to at the time um and then of course with the blog at nature in particular you know i dealt with a lot of hardline climate skeptics um, who had sort of quite, you know, some quite nasty trolling behavior. And really, there was no convincing them, but I thought it was important to refute their arguments, you know. So we'd make um, an effort to always, you know, comment back on, on you know, you know, basically sort of fake news <laughs> that they had put on the blog in the comments section. I still see a lot of that on Twitter. And, you know, every now and again, they'll kind of one of them will raise their heads on Twitter. But um yeah, I think the most intense period of that for me was definitely when I was running the blog at Nature. You're you're talking about uh, different sorts of relationships, and at least the United States. I don't know your numbers are different in the UK and probably other places in the world, but um, there's seventy percent overall acceptance of the reality of climate change. So for a lot of people, you might think you're you're wasting your time because you. We see a lot of climate change denial, just like flat flat Earth conspiracy things, in 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 media and on social media, especially, and blogs. But um, you might uh, maybe if they already you might be talking to someone that already accepts it, but they might want more information about what they can do about it. Like you were talking about making sustainable choices, and also like supporting policy that that helps us address the bigger issues and supporting scientists um but they're, they're the person kind of person you're talking about that's that's on a blog and posting uh studies from 30 years ago probably they're in a very small percentage of people even half republicans accept uh climate change yeah but unfortunately for mm -hmm. us here in the united states uh, our policy on climate change is being dictated by that smaller more conservative population that doesn't want things to change from coal that sort of thing mm, i know i mean unfortunately i guess when you think about what's behind that denial there is probably vested interests they're trying to protect their own economic interests and you know there's powerful forces that are you know willing to 
do that and to fund it. So, I mean, unfortunately, I guess that's what you're up against. And I equate it to to uh, be to discovering that you're pre-emphysematic when your doctor tells you that. And I'm sorry, I, have, I didn't catch that. Let's let's measure a smoker, a smoker, right? A smoker goes to see the doctor. The doctor says you're going to have to quit because you're pre-emphysematic, meaning oh, you're yeah. you're about to get emphysema. You're moving mm. into that. You need to stop right now or that you're going to have this problem and it's going to kill you for sure. Mm. Well, that um, one, the, the, the person doesn't want to change their habit. They enjoy smoking and they're going to keep smoking. Damn it. Yeah. They just need to come up with an excuse. And the other problem, which actually helps facilitate this, is that the, the doom message is so bad that what can they do about it? So I, ta I spoke to somebody with yeah. exactly this condition who found out that he's pre-emphysematic and a year okay. later, he's still smoking frequently. Yeah. Why? This is what's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm just going to roll with it. Mm. I mean, I think your point about the doom and gloom message is, you know, spot on because I think a lot of um, research into the psychology of climate change into how people, you know, understand and receive climate change um, shows that people just respond far better to positive messages than to negative messages. In fact, I think there was one piece of research that I read that said for every climate threat that we mention, we need to mention three positives of addressing it. So I think that that's, you know, they're really on to something with the kind of, you know, tactic or strategy they've taken with the Green New Deal in the US because, you know, they're tying it into people's interests in, in so far as like if you've got someone who just doesn't see climate change as a priority in their life, maybe they understand that it's happening, but really they're just more worried about the economy and healthcare and jobs and all of those things that people, most people worry about. Um, the Green New Deal ties it into that. So, you know, this idea that we could sort of create millions of jobs for Americans by reinvigorating, you know, the infrastructure and that we could sort of like have a better, build a better world all around where there's better social inclusion and where we're not, you know, sort of ruining our environment and polluting our environment. It's sort of part of a bigger picture that I think you could get more people to buy into. And I think that's really smart. I think, you know, to get the message across, it does need to be partly positive and it needs to talk to people's interests. This, this I've seen this research on Yale's Climate Communication uh, Center that if you can talk about mutual benefits, like the Green New Deal yeah. and more green jobs and, some people are talking about uh, looking at places like that are dependent on coal or or ranching or something like that and making putting jobs there that are part of transforming our infrastructure because I mean we we kind of glossed over sea level rise but I was just looking today that they're predicting it's worse than they thought because they've got better imaging satellite imaging of of elevations now okay. and in 30 years, uh, of course, parts of UK are going to be underwater on the coast. Um, not as far as London, but um, in uh, parts of the United States, everywhere you would expect uh, New Orleans, uh, yeah. that stuff like that. In just mm. 30 years, I'll still be alive, then I'm 47. And if, if, if we don't make these changes. Uh, so, like, I my, my experience with a really resistant person who watches Fox News all the time, yeah. and they... They watch Matlock still every day. <laughs> I don't even know if you remember Matlock. Oh my God, I do. That's like brings me back <laughs> to my childhood. There was a, yes. a funny thing in Ireland, you know, sort of 30 years ago that most of our television came from the US. So we were all raised on, yeah, US TV shows. I'm sorry. <laughs> when we went to the Netherlands, we were surprised by just this. They speak Dutch, but they mm. also speak this incredible American English, like perfect. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And they're like, it's, we learned it from movies. <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> find like, that in Germany too, actually. Yeah. yeah. In parts of Europe for sure. Yeah. So there yeah. were the three prongs that I was mentioning before. They're wait, interested. Uh, uh, wait, you can get your question in a second. I hate to be rushing, but she has deadlines. Uh, she has writing deadlines, but um, here. And what, what I told her was that mutual benefit thing that even if you don't accept yeah. what the science, 97% of the scientists say, are saying, shouldn't we be reducing emissions, carbon emissions anyways? 
and she she maybe she i think she got it on some level mm -hmm. because she was saying well if we don't use plastic bags which is kind of it's kind of on topic too because it's made from petroleum but sure. and it's also polluting the ocean but um uh we'll have to use paper and then we'll burn trees like so like there's this infinite regression but there isn't but i told her remember we used to use glass uh, back in back you used to get a lot of your things in glass and glass can break down in um in rivers eventually unlike plastic but or we could use go back to returning our, our containers back to the old days so yeah. making that personal connection um trying to say hey this benefits us still even if you uh don't accept but because i would have a really hard time with how much fox has been feeding propaganda to this person sure. yeah. talking about evidence and like they think they have their opinion too and it's not really opinion like this podcast is matter oh, of fact science not I matter know. of opinion science. that sort of yeah. false balance you know oh my god it's painful yeah. isn't it like this uh, it erroneous idea that climate change should be treated as a matter of opinion rather than as a matter of fact and, you know and i don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings about their opinion you know they're a nice person and that's not the point you know mm. Yes. So the three yeah. prongs that I were talk well, I was talking about is the one you have the people that are just in denial whether whether it's because of vested interests you know, with economic interests or religious interests. I mean I've met people, including the one that she's talking about right now, who mm. who were convinced that that we can never drive another species into extinction because God will somehow oh, protect wow. them all. And, yeah. and it just it was really difficult to get that person to accept that a species had ever gone extinct. There must be some of them somewhere, some still. Okay. Right, they're just mm -hmm. refusing to listen to reason. So that's one prong. And activists like myself, and I would like to refer to to Potholer Fifty Four, another YouTube channel who's been concentrating on the climate change issue, and doing a spectacular job of that. Um, activists, I think, will be taking on a lot of the people that deny whether climate change is a thing or not. Yeah. The other two prongs that, that we would need to know about, and we covered a little bit of that uh, in this inter interview, is. What realistically are we going to expect to happen if this continues unabated? And we 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 got the sea level rise. We got the we got a potential loss of oxygen, which I think is substantial. Mm, yeah. And used, I think you were saying by the end of this century, we we were going to have such a depletion in oxygen. Yeah, today, I mean, I think I think if we stay with business as usual, we're basically looking at a mass extinction of marine life. I mean, that's I think. It, now I've studied mass extinctions, and so I have a perspective yeah, on what well, these are like. Okay. And, and I, I wish that other people in my uh, region of the country uh, um, yeah. understood the, that that mass extinctions actually happened. That like there was mm. there was a paleo history that the world isn't just six thousand years old and it's not flat, right? So what what difference does it make if you talk about currents or ice caps if people don't believe there are currents or ice caps because they think everything's flat or it's six thousand years old or what have you? So the the, the second prong was talk about what realistically we're going to happen. And then the third prong is what you mentioned before about needing to have a positive message. And I know that there's going to be people, people that you provide any, any resolution, and there are many, many resolutions. There's many positive things we can do to abate this, to turn it back. We have the technology to do this. We have the means to do it. But there's always going to be some naysayer who says that this won't work or that won't work, and therefore we shouldn't do anything at all. Mm. Just run headlong off the cliff and kill ourselves because there's no way to apply brakes mm. or reversed, yeah. which yeah. would be a good idea. But I was, but I still want to hear more about what positively can be done. We talked about diet because we know that the. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, Something made a noise out there. Mute your microphone, honey. I had to unmute it to say that. Okay. Um, what, what, so what, what kind of things can be done? Do you mean um, just a, on an individual level, on a policy level? I mean, I suppose I, I think on a policy level, look, I think the problem is we, um, the things that we consume are just too cheap, really, in terms of, you know, their actual cost. We're not factoring in the cost of the environment. And so, you know, it's pretty clear that we need to, you know, I think factor that in um, and that that needs to be happening at a policy level, you know, um, 
I also think that we need to think about energy efficiency. I mean, I think that's really important. Um, another, another aspect of that, if I could jump in, I mean, yeah. what China started doing, now China's a massive polluter and everybody knows that, but China also understands that they have to do something about it. So they made a huge investment, which created an awful lot of jobs mm -hmm. going for green energy, going for sustainable for light for windmills and tidal generators and so forth, which, yeah entirely green entirely renewable and it produces a, a, a huge industry that was more this more productive than the fossil fuel industry is the only difference is that the fossil fuel industry is owned by a very few employing a great many and these these renewable enemies and uh, energies are not that way yeah so you, you can't monopolize it the same way that you can the fossil fuels you know i think um I suppose when I think about policies, I think they really need to be tailored to each country. I think we need overall policies that are going to, you know, um, whether it's putting a price on carbon or having energy efficiency measures. But I think when it comes to individual countries, you know, you do need to think about what's kind of politically feasible. Like, for example, here in Ireland, there is a lot of pushback against changing diet and particularly reducing meat consumption. Um, in rural Ireland because it's such an agricultural economy. And so no one is going to really get elected here if that's their policy. Okay, so it's just so, you know, firmly, staunchly based in agriculture that that's going to be an issue. Whereas there's a lot of support for things like low emissions, transport, low emissions, housing, you know, and um, there's a huge replanting project. Ireland have said that they will plant 440 million trees in the next 20 years. So, you know, maybe that doesn't apply elsewhere. Maybe elsewhere, they'll have a lot more, more traction in getting people to change diet or to you know make other adjustments so i think on a national level you just need to see what's politically palpable yeah. but i think that you know there needs to be overall efforts to sequester carbon and to promote energy efficiency and to reduce consumption because the problem is we're just consuming too much yep we, you know? we are the great consumers and that and that is a huge problem because that, Even well, i'm gonna have to go in about a minute or two just because i have to yes is that even, okay? Yes. Even if there wasn't uh, the climate change, our consumption uh, and population growth is not sustainable uh, up from the point of feeding everybody. So uh, we there need to be better solutions. And we need to listen to scientists yeah. on this. I mean, that's a, it is a tricky one, isn't it? And I think, you know, most people who study this seem to think that um, female education is the key you know, to, I suppose, lowering fertility and ultimately, you know, curbing population growth. Um, but in some ways, you know, when you think about where the highest population growth is, if you think about, you know, I think six people born in Chad probably have the climate or carbon footprint equivalent of one person born in the UK. So in some ways, we've got that discrepancy of high population growth in places that aren't in some ways really driving the climate problem to the same extent and that brings me back to, to saying again I think we just need to think about our consumption um, it's difficult though because you've got all of these you know rising economies that want to behave like the west and they want to have the privileges that we've enjoyed for decades and you know it's very difficult politically to say that that can't happen there, so, that's interesting because we were talking about this in class and you're going to be giving a class next year at yeah. John Top about communicating about climate change yeah. at, for science communicators uh, and writers. Right. And um, amongst people that accept climate change, this is where the, this is the tricky part, like uh, getting them to understand um, what we need to maybe sacrifice or, or, yeah. or pain and because sometimes they point to other countries like India or China yeah and yes a uh, hundred years ago a lot of Western countries industrialized and we created a lot of these emissions and we still are and yeah. and some of these other countries are starting to industrialize and they're creating emissions and but they have we didn't have the technology they do now so That's are true. we willing are we willing to to like help other countries come online in a more greener way. Like a lot of people think they won't, but India just turned down for coal-based plants for green energy. Like it, they're still 
they're still creating a lot of pollution. But like we can get there, you know, if we work together. Yeah, mm, the, the, absolutely. The pollution in it. India that's was the, the pollution in India was is was unbearable. It was I've never been to uh, to to the Chinese area like Beijing and everything where the, the pollution is like world class bad. I've only been to Delhi, which was like the second worst in the world. The, but the pollution was okay. I mean, it's a it was obscuring the other side of the street. The, mm. <laughs> the fog was so bad. Mm.